Welcome to Public Power Underground, Northwest Public Power's premier weekly infotainment program that covers Northwest public power and public power adjacent news from a power department's perspective. So hey, public power people, on today's show, we get an update on Northwest power markets on air reports, talk to, talk to Tacoma Power's Almaz Nagash about demand response programs, Hear from Franklin PUD's Brian Johnson and Holly Dorman about their approach to post-2028 discussions. Get guest news from Oregon Department of Energy's Blake Shalid and News Data's Mark Orenshaw. And cover more public power and public power adjacent news on Public Power Desktop. <clears throat> I'm the voice of the underground and economic development manager for Klatskin PUD, Brian Fawcett. I'm Paul Dockery, the manager of the power department and co-host of Public Power Underground. This is Erin Guillory, the star of Erin Reports, co-star of Public Power Underground and financial analyst for Klatskin IPUD. I am the current power analyst for Klatskin IPUD and the co-star of Public Power Underground, Ian Bledsoe. Well, so no third person for me in this week. I'm a little disappointed. We'll just transition <laughs> right into Erin Reports. We're starting this week, like most weeks, checking in on power market indicators in the Northwest with our first segment, Erin Reports. Excellent. This is Aaron Reports, where we try to get up to speed, as Fawcett mentioned, on Northwest Mark Indicators for April 8, 2021. I'm Aaron Guillory, and I've got your market update for the week. April September flows of the Dow's are expected to be at 90% of normal, down 1% from last week. Outflows of the Dow's peaked over the past week at 173.9 KCFS on April 5th at 2200 hours. Midday elevation at Grand Coulee on April 7th was 1270 and 10, down about a foot from reported last week as peak outflows decreased from a peak of 163.8. KCFS on March 30th at 0800 hours to peak up flow of 128.4 KCFS on April 5th at 0800 hours. Checking on snow in the region using Antrogy's aggregation of basin data, the snow water equivalent for BC hydro generation basin is 116.86% of normal for mid-seed, 99.92%, and aggregating all the snow in the Columbia River Basin that'll flow through the Bonneville Dam, they estimate there is a 112.32% of normal snow blanket. Spot market power in the Northwest for delivery April 8th is at $32.71 with gas at $2.52 per MMBTU, translating to Boost spark spread of 1508 and heat rate of 14 grand. In turn, markets bomb for mid C has climbed $5.69 from a week ago, now at 3147 per megawatt hour. Taking a look at fish counts for adult spring Chinook this week, 30 Chinook passed through the Bonneville Dam on Monday, an 11 count up from last week. Spending a beat at Bonneville's bouncing authority, peak load this past week was 7,666 April 5th at 740 and 745 in the AM. We'll stick with 740. During loads, peak hydrogen was at 10,061, wind gen was 926 megawatts, conventional units were at 1062, and nuclear was at uh, 1,095. This week in NOAA climate forecast, the six to 10 day outlook has temp in the region with a 33 to 60% chance of being above normal, with layers with a normal to growing probability of being above as you head uh, east or below as you head east. Precipitation in the region largely has a 33 to 70% chance of being below. And that's all we've got for this update. Back to you, Brian. So sunshine and fish. That's that's what I heard. Was oh, that fish count? Thirty? Is that pretty good? I noticed it went up to like forty three the following day. Is that pretty good? It's 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 moving up. Yeah, they should start moving as the water warms up too. And, nice. and like the peak, what 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 are we talking about? What numbers should we expect? Hundreds in a day or just it should, so it should be in the thousands, not like thousands. High thousands. Wow! Yeah. In one the, day, the peak. Yeah. Okay. Something yes. to look forward to. Yeah, I think uh, we're talking, I'm trying to remember, might be about 80,000 uh, or 90,000 upriver fish going past Bonneville this year for springers. Wow. That could be off, but I, I that's in the ballpark. Okay. Okay. Well, thanks for the report, Aaron. Uh, next up is our weekly walkthrough Northwest Public Power and Public Power Adjacent News in a segment we like to call Public Power Desktop. A senior power analyst for Tacoma Power and returning friend of the underground, Almaz Nagash, PhD, came back to talk about demand response programs this week. Hi, Almaz. Welcome to Public Power Underground. Hey, Paul. Welcome back. I'm really excited to have you back. Good to be here. So I, I thought of you a few weeks ago on Public Power Underground. We, we talked about this article about a California consumer choice aggregate signing for mm -hmm. a demand response program with Ohms Connect. And mm -hmm. I, I did the call out like, hey, public power people with passion about demand response, 
let's let, I, I just don't know about demand response. I haven't formed a theory about ways to make it useful. I thought of you because you and I've had conversations at peanut system planning committees about demand response. So, and then after this, Tacoma Power announces an electric fuel tariff, also some demand response components there. So this is great news. Um, what Help me understand your passion about demand response and your, and your background. Yeah, so this is this goes all the way back to my time at UW when I was getting my um, doing my dissertation. So I wrote uh, did my doctoral research in uh, valuing distributed energy resources. Okay. So the whole point of my um, my research was finding ways to um, fairly compensate the demand side for the benefits they provide to the grid. Um, and so demand response was about 50% of what uh, my research focused on. And I just, I've carried that passion with me in, into my professional um, work here at uh, Tacoma Power as well. That's awesome. I actually did not know I was speaking to uh, doc, Dr. Almaz Nagesh. I, I feel correct. like that honorific title, I need to use it more. Do you use the PhD letters in your, in your email sign offs? Cause I, I, I just, have I just been glossing over this? It, it, it is, and I don't, I just don't use my signature in my, um, email a lot, but it is in my signature. So next time I, I write an email, I'll make sure to include my signature. <laughs> that's right. I love it. Um, th there is, so it sounds like you thought a lot about, if you wrote a dissertation about it, the way to value the load side in, in, in the grid. Um, I, I haven't thought about it in that way. I'm a power supply has been kind of where I grew up in the industry. I, um, and I, and I want to learn and I want to learn about equitable ways to do it. So um, so can you talk about Tacoma, how you've approached it and the ways to for a novice to think through the load side and demand response valuation? Yeah, so uh, Tacoma, one of the things that I love about Tacoma Power is the way we are. Uh, we really try to be customer focused. Our customers are, are everything to us. And when I came into the utility, we had a customer um, that had for years wanted a demand response program. They, they're a low that they're, they're very flexible, but the, the tariff, the rate that we, we provide them incentivizes just to stay flat. And because they can stay flat, they stay flat. Um, so there was, on the one hand, we had that customer that, that wanted to monetize their flexibility. Um, and then at the same time, um, we're updating our resource adequacy metrics um, and finding, uh, you know, with all of our re renewables and, and, and increased um, uh, climate uh, objectives in the region, that there was going to be a need for, for capacity. So we, we've been blessed with all of this hydro for so long, uh, but with retiring thermal, we were going to need capacity. Um, and so that, that's where I, I found you know, this is a, a, a match made in heaven. We've got this capacity need and a customer that really wants to provide capacity, right. how to develop a program that's beneficial to, to everybody involved. So that, that was the, 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 the initial um, forming of this idea that I had with uh, demand response at Tacoma Power. Yeah. So as you think about the load sides uh, availability to be flexible. So I'm, I, I'm, I'm of the school where what I want out of load is flat. That's what I want. Um, uh, it's a optimal, optimal usage of my distribution system. But to your point, if there is a capacity need and there is a capacity in the region that load may be able to provide it. So how flexible were they and what price signal did they need? To me, it's all about what price signal does the industrial customer need to actually move and how to provide that price signal. Where, how, how do you provide a price signal? Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. And that's that's been the main reason why demand response has struggled so much in the Northwest is just that that price differential has just not been here and, and it really hasn't made it uh, worth it. Um, but when you have uh, uh, like a need for capacity, moving for a long-term need for capacity, then you start to see uh, a bigger uh, signal there. It's, it's the avoided cost of the, the, of the resource that you don't have to have right. because you've got this the demand response resource. So that's part of where we saw um, some, some, some potential value, uh, even though it's not, it may not be high right now. We're, we're seeing the signs of how that, that, that signal, where that signal is going. So there was that resource adequacy um, price signal uh, and also a little bit of economic uh, as well um, when, when they're 
you know, extreme events down in California or extreme weather events that sort of send the prices um, really high. There's some opportunity for us to, um, to, to arbitrage and, and make some money in the wholesale market using the flexibility of our own generation resources. So those were the, the two uh, areas where we saw we might be able to find some, some value for, for demand response. So it looks like the electrofuels tariff, it, it is not an incentive on a per instance of reduced load. It is a lower overall energy rate and demand rate because of the conditions. It's almost like a, I mean, a call option, maybe. I'm not a trader. So uh, all the traders out there, I'm sorry if I'm using the wrong terms, but it's, it's just like a, you get a lower rate because you may be, we may be able to dispatch you in that would be valuable to us. So that's one way to think about it. Are there other ways that you have thought about it and that Tacoma is thinking about or has proposed in the past? Well, and, you know, and we have co considered both of those. We're looking at ways of um, having that uh, compensation that's based on how often the resource is, is dispatched. Um, and then another, another way of looking at it is to just have a, um, yeah, a, a like you see in the electrofuel rate, uh, discount on the demand charge. Um, that's there because you're, it's expected that that resource will be able to provide flexibility um, uh, when it's needed. So for the most, uh, the difference, how we're treating that right now at, at, at Tacoma Power is the, the more flexible resources, those resources that can really not have that much limitation except that we provide them a certain minimum load factor. Uh, they, they've been provided this electrofuel uh, rate which has that deduction in the demand charge. Uh, but for customers that are a little less flexible, maybe there are, there's a, a limit on the number of times you can call them. Like they have a lot more restrictions on them. Uh, sometimes it can be a little bit more uh, useful to, to have those, um, uh, like a hybrid rate where they get a little, you know, a fixed charge in a, a discount each month, a small fixed charge discount, but then an additional compensation every time you disp dispatch them. Um, so those are the two ways that we're, we're looking at them. And it, and it depends on the, the flexibility of the, the resource involved. Okay, that's really interesting. But it sounds like the electrofuel rate applies to some that are fairly flexible. And that must be in yes. those instances when it's really flexible, you can provide a better discount on just your demand factor. It sounds this applies, they have to respond to your load reduction request in 10 minutes or less. That's like a, that's pretty good. That is. That is, um, and the, so and the more uh, the more quickly a resource can respond, the, the higher its value. We can use it for reserves. We can use it for more types of uh, of grid needs, and so that's where that value starts to increase. Um, so, like I, that 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 incentive is is absolutely tied to the flexibility of the resource. And one of the other things that uh, you kind of teed me up on was was around uh, clean energy grants and what was it a liquid uh, liquid air energy storage liquid air energy storage project that actually didn't come to fruition but you it sounds like worked heavily on yeah so this was the project that I was talking about initially um, where we had that customer that wanted to provide flexibility and this need that we see coming in the region um, so. Liquid air energy storage um, is actually, it, it is exactly what it sounds where you take air, separate it into its constituent parts, uh, cool it and, and liquefy it. And, and those um, air products have value, you know, the, the oxygen goes to hospitals, you know, they're, they're used in different uh, processes. Um, but they are like that, that product, that liquefied air, it, it, that process to liquefy air is so energy intensive. Um, it's, it's essentially storage. Like you can store gigawatt hours, depending on how large the, the, the liquid air tank is. You can store gigawatt hours of energy. And so um, what, what this project was, it wasn't where you use liquid air energy storage to store the energy. And then when you want the generation back, you sort of, you know, uh, Turn the return the liquid air to its gas state and then drive a turbine. So it was not that type of liquid air energy storage. This was purely going to be demand response enabled. So we would partner with that customer, um, put a new, the, the proposal was to put a new tank on, on their site. So we would have the benefit of, you know, they've got millions of dollars worth of air liquefaction infrastructure. And all we would have to do is put an additional storage tank on their site to store that that extra energy. And in the case there's a demand response event, some event where we need to call on them, 
they can actually provide that flexibility, come off the grid, give us and allow us to use that energy for whatever purposes we need. And their, um, um, their business isn't interrupted because they, they're, they're able to use what's in the tank. So that's essentially the way the project was uh, supposed to work. However, that's like I said, it's, it's, it was using demand response and not generation. So after being awarded this grant, um, Commerce did come back later and say, because it didn't have a generation component, um, it didn't qualify. And so the, the project didn't move forward, but uh, I'm still hoping that we can find some more funding for this and make this work because it's it's truly something where the grid is gonna benefit, the customer is gonna benefit. And like, how often can you find a demand response um, program where coming off the grid, like their demand reduction literally does them no harm, like it, no discomfort. As a customer, if I you know reduce my AC or you know maybe use my water, there's a potential that I might have some discomfort. In this case, there was gonna be no discomfort for the customer, like a truly win-win demand response program. So the key on this one, as I'm hearing it, is it, there is disruption to their work stream if they reduce this load and don't have a backup storage that can continue their processes. So by putting in a storage tank, it, it reduces that impact on their, their processes because, you know, we serve paper mills. There's a lot of paper mills in the region. Um, and there's always this demand response seems like, cause they're large loads seems very beneficial, but there's the people side of it, where if you shut down a process, what are you going to do with all the people? Um, but exactly. it sounds like this, this is actually an efficiency where, Hey, I just, I got another tank I can pull from I can reduce my load and not disrupt services. That, that is exactly right. And so like right now they have a little bit of flexibility um, inherent in there, uh, but by adding the additional tank, it would have given us long duration storage. So not, you know, a, a few hours here and there like you typically have with, with batteries. It would have given us long duration storage capacity. Yeah, and, and not to go into uh, something that didn't ultimately come to fruition, but how did you think about the, the price incentive then? What, so if this gets the grant, it's their tank. And then is it just a call option for you then, because you provided the tank, you would disrupt, or you would offset them whenever you wanted to, or was there some rate mechanism and pricing mechanism that passed it forward? Uh, yes. <laughs> so it was all of that. Um, because uh, this was going to be obviously using state funds, so the, there had to be some return of benefit to, um, to our customers, to, to the people. So there was going to be a, a contract that, that they had to provide us, you know, X amount of uh, demand response events, um, you know, by season, by month, you know, length, all of those terms of the DR events were going to be called for, uh, were um, established. And then there was a small um, uh, rate incentive as well. Uh, to also uh, incentivize them to, to to be there when we actually need them, so we needed them. So we we split the the incentive. Part of it was going to be in the the capital uh, of getting that tank uh, built, and okay. another part was going to be in the rate. Just right. to, wow. to ensure there was incentive across the entire life of the project, from 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 construction to operation, uh, all the way through to the end. Yeah, that's a smart way to do it. Um, we're running out of time, but I really. Uh, want to talk more about this, especially on the residential side. Do you have similar thoughts on residential demand response? And can we dig into that in a future uh, future topic? As a future topic? Yeah, so right now Tacoma Power is piloting a uh, residential demand response for hot water heaters. Um, someone else is, is leading that project. Um, you might be interested in, in talking to him about that, but I'd also be happy to, to share with you um, uh, our yeah, our I'm going to float this idea. Do you want to interview him for Public Power Underground? I'll come on, like you do the interview. Be like, hey, hey, colleague at Tacoma Power. <laughs> here's a question I have for you. I, I, will, I would love to do that. Oh, we're going to do this. This is great. I'll, uh, I'll give him all the hard questions. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay, thank you for coming back on. Great to have you. Uh, I love I love the uh, new insight into your past. I did not know you uh, were a PhD. Dr. Almaz. Learn something every day. Good I'm gonna be like special uh, doctoral correspondent. That's gonna that's that's gonna be your title, I think. It's gonna be great. I can I can I can live with that. <laughs> I love it. Thanks, Almaz. We'll talk to you thank later. You. All right, bye. Clearing up issue number 1998.
1998, Dan Catchpole authored an article on uh, Puget Sound Energy's integrated resource plan that was filed April 1st. Dan's lead is that Puget sees biodiesel as the best option to firm up the 4.4 gigawatts of renewable resources it expects to add to its portfolio over the next 20 years. Digging deeper into this article, Dan notes that the IRP's um, preferred portfolio includes biodiesel fueled frame peakers at a, and assumed a fixed market uh, price of 3720 per MMBTU adjusted annually for inflation, which is a lot more expensive than natural gas. The higher dispatch costs uh, mean that the resources get dispatch very infrequently, which they highlight is exactly the plan. Low usage of the biodiesel and low capacity factor for the units. For more, you can find Dan on Twitter at dcatchpole, that's D-C-A-T-C-H-P-O-L-E, or find the article on Clearing Up, which you should already be subscribed to. Okay, the newest friend of the underground and an engineer for the Oregon Department of Energy, Blake Shalid, agreed to drop in with some guest news. Hey, Blake, welcome to Public Power Underground. Thanks, Paul. Great to be here. Got the Notre Dame connection in Oregon. Uh, found our, each other in Oregon. Are you from Oregon? I didn't, I've never asked. No, I'm not. I'm actually from uh, Tennessee, uh, but my wife is from Oregon. My wife's from Salem um, and we lived in Tennessee for seven years after we graduated college, but always had the plan to move to back to Oregon for April, my wife um, and me move, make the move to Oregon. So in 2014, uh, we made the move here and I started working for the Oregon Department of Energy. That's really cool. Uh, similarly, my wife is from Washington, and which is how we got out to the Pacific Northwest. Um, it's, yeah, it's funny, gotta, how, funny how that works. <laughs> really funny how that works. Um, so today, I wanted to kind of get some news out of the Oregon Department of Energy. I think we need some like good DOE content on Public Power Underground. So in 200 words or less, what's the news on electric vehicle infrastructure and buildings from Oregon DOE? Uh, yeah, so Oregon, like many states, is interested in, in EV electric vehicle adoption and supporting infrastructure, um, such as EV chargers where we live and work, um, and preparing our new construction to be EV ready to support EV charging and, and reducing the installation costs down the road. So starting with an executive order in 2017 that targeted EV ready requirements in the building code, we've now seen a bill in the current legislative session, it's House Bill 2180, that would further direct the state to include the building code requirements by July of 22 for provisions for electric service capacity, which is essentially electric service capacity sized for EV charging stations or room for future expansion, plus conduit to support future installation of level two EV chargers for at least 20% of parking spaces. Now the requirements in the bill would only apply to certain commercial and multifamily buildings, but on the residential side, EV Ready is also part of an executive order from 2017, EO 1720, and scheduled for inclusion in the building code by October of 2022. But on the residential side, it's still TBD uh, to be determined exactly what that'll look like. Um, the bill, the current bill, House Bill 2180, is moving through the legislative process and is passed out of the House and is now onto the Senate. So we'll be tracking that to follow along how it goes. So is, is this building codes your niche at niche at the Department of Energy? Is that the area you work in the most? Uh, it is, yeah, I do a lot in the, in the building space. Um, I sit on the Construction Industry Energy Board, uh, which is a, a, a consultation and advisory board to our sister agency, the Building Codes Division, who's responsible for actually administering the building code in Oregon. But we work closely with a lot of stakeholders and our sister agencies for building code development and training and outreach. So as this yeah, legislation, go ahead. Oh, I should say uh, specifically with the energy code as part of the building code, yep. Yeah, so as this type of legislation passes through the different um, chambers, uh, your part, do you support some of the analysis to help legislatures know the impact of this or are you tracking it to know what work stream you're gonna have in the future? Yeah, it's a little bit of both. We are, um, you know, obviously an, an advisor to the legislature if they ask uh, if there are questions for us. Um, and then a lot of it is also just tracking along to, to inform our future work stream and to be able to educate our stakeholders on what the requirements are if something does pass or if something does move through so that we can prepare uh, Oregonians for what's coming down the line. 
And in that preparation for Oregonians, a lot of us uh, really interested in grants, incentives, ways we can promote this within our service territory. Are you for Oregon uh, Utilities kind of the, the conduit of helping me find where all of these incentives, how to get them? Uh, we certainly can be. Yeah, we have we have staff that focus a lot in the transportation and electric vehicle space. We don't currently have any incentives right now as an agency, but um, but if we do know of any, we can certainly help be a conduit to to broadcast those and make them make Oregonians more aware of where to where to find those. Okay, I really I to to kind of give the plug. You have this wonderful what do you call it, the EV mapping tool where the EVs are in the state. What's it called? Yes, yes. Uh, the EV dashboard. dashboard. Yeah. Um, dashboard. Thanks for bringing this up. Yeah. I uh, we um, live we work in Columbia County, Oregon. There's currently 290. Uh, we're trying to we're trying to get people, uh, you know, encouraged to get electric vehicles within our service territory. Just so you know. That's great. Yeah, yeah, and we put this EV dashboard up as a way just to communicate more information about where EVs are are. Um, are in Oregon where the chargers are, um, the benefits of electric vehicles to just get the information out there and help help Oregonians. Great, and, and if you ever have questions about how people should think about electric vehicle rates and public charging rates, that's my area of passion. So, you know, it, rate structures on electric vehicle public charging infrastructure, you know who to call Blake. Just remember, it's call me, I know, I got, I have opinions. Will do. Thanks. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for joining. This was great. Thanks, Blake. Yeah. Thank you, Paul. In true public power underground fashion, we've in innovated again with guest introductions of guests. A fellow pu power manager and special projects lead for Franklin QD and Public Power Underground's premier promoter, Brian Johnson, joins to introduce Holly Dorman to talk about the post-2028 process. Hi, Brian. Welcome to Public Power Underground. What's going on? I've been waiting so long and you have declined inviting me and my willingness to purchase tickets multiple times. Uh, that is not what I remember at, at all, but it is very special for us because you are our promotion consultant. Um, I'm also thinking of like calling you the public power promoter. It seems like we should have like a promoter in there because of the belt. Like you should be like the belt I, promoter. I need my own belt. Since I took that title over, we're up 93% on YouTube subscribers alone. I know. Maybe it's like you don't need the belt because that's for, you know, that's for the wrestlers. You yeah, need like, I could be Vince McMahon. You need the suit. Like the promoters always have the suit and maybe the, the fur like vest thingy. What I am I thinking that. of? Yeah, like a, I could get some faux fur on this Under Armour and and yeah. knock it out. Be yeah, a, be a little Vince McMahon, comb my hair back. Yeah, I think maybe we got we got to work through that. Yeah, um, we can do that. On today, we're innovating a new thing. Whereas we have a guest introduce a guest. So for the guest introduction of the guest, uh, somewhere there's a guest in there, and you're going to introduce them. So what do you got? What do you got for us, Brian? So today, it is my pleasure to introduce the Assistant General Manager of Franklin Public Utility District. With over 15 years of public power management experience, she is a former Wrangler of Twins, a current Wrangler of Grandchildren, the Queen of Succulent Gardening, self-proclaimed, my personal Craigslist protege and two-time defending boss. She's not superstitious, but admittedly, she is a little stitious, which makes her always think one step ahead, like a carpenter building stairs. The one and only Holly Dorman. Let's give it up. Hi, Holly. Welcome to Public Power Underground. Thanks, Paul. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, I'm excited to have you. From Brian's intro, your, your hype man, uh, it I sounds like yeah. you're a fan of The Office. Yeah, I'm, I'm a late adopter, I will admit. Um, I will say initially it was kind of made me cringe from a uh, you know, management standpoint, HR side. I, I had a really hard time, but it has grown on me over the years. And yes, I, I enjoy the office. Well, Erin and I have this ongoing conversation. She is a, a, a person who's come to the office through streaming services. 
I was someone who came to the office when it was still appointment viewing on NBC on Thursday nights. So I don't know where you are in that spectrum, but I just want to say it is real fandom to have watched it on television. It's also real fandom to have watched it on streaming services. I don't appreciate when Aaron picks on me and saying that I'm not a real fan because I don't watch it on the streaming services. I just want to put that out there. Well, I guess, you know, I have my, my family watched it on, on just, you know, Thursday nights, but I couldn't do it. Like I said, I I tried and I'm just like, I'm sitting there thinking this is wrong. This is a (laughs) lawsuit, you you know, just went down the whole thing, but uh, thank goodness for streaming because I was able to take it in in small bites and um, come to love it as much as, as a true, you know, Thursday night viewer. So. Good. Well, uh, I'm, we, I'm in Switzerland here. I'm on either side. No yeah, side. and that's all I'm saying is both are okay. It's okay yeah. to be a fan either way. I don't like it when she judges me. Um, but I'm going to pivot to post 2028. So we've we've had some conversations on Public Power Underground about resource adequacy, about the rate case that's going on, also about energy and balance. But we haven't yet done the post 2028 conversation. You're the first person. Um, and how this goes will depend on whether we do it again. So it's a little Uh-oh, bit of pressure. No pressure. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit of pressure. Um, I'm curious about Franklin's thoughts about the forum, how you're entering into these discussions, and how do we make this process fruitful, collaborative, and get somewhere that's productive for all of us? You know, I think um, at least our approach is we feel like we need to come to the table with an, some ideas. Um, you know, you mentioned all of these things that are on Bonneville's plate right now. And I just don't think that they have a lot of time. Um, they're spread really thin and I don't think they have time to, to sit down and start coming up with ideas. You know, it was a big lift, uh, the change that they made back in 08 when they changed to the, the TRM and, and, and all of the work that went into that. So I think for, for this to be productive, we need to come to the table with ideas things that we can say to Bonneville to take back and let them look at. They can work through the pros, the cons, why it will work, why it wouldn't work. And and then we can come back, come to the table and hash it out. Um, I think if we just walk in with some big high level concepts, um, I just don't know that we're really going to get anywhere. And, And then I think there's a little bit of feeling that it's working fine. So why do we need to do anything to it, the contract wise? So so you talk about bringing ideas and are you thinking of that as, as public power, as Franklin, as all, like, or all of the above, like we all need to the, bring table. Okay. Yeah. Cause I think, you know, there's a lot of public power, um, common ground that we can all get behind and say, yeah, this, these are, you know, core concepts, core ideas that we, we believe in, but you know, we're different than some other utilities We're mid-sized, you know, you've got your small rural, you've got your large municipalities. Um, so I think each one of those is going to have a, a little bit different take on what they need. So I, I think we, it needs, but um, I think at PPC, they were talking about transparency. I think that's the biggest thing is if you bring an idea to Bonneville, you're transparent about it. This is what we're thinking because this works for Franklin Beauty. Okay, you know, let's figure out if uh, that's going to work broadly, or maybe it is something that's specific. And if it, um, but again, I think ultimately it has to be, you know, neutral to other parties because we don't want, the idea isn't that there's winners and losers. It's, you know, how does this benefit um, us as a whole? And yeah, maybe there's a little bit of a, you know, I'm thinking like products. There may be a product that works great for Franklin that isn't something that would work for anybody else, but ultimately it gives Bonneville um, price certainty. It brings in a, a steady revenue stream and it's a win for other utilities because they can benefit from the, that certainty. Yeah, one of the areas I think it's, it's important that transparency you talked about is if we're going to bring ideas, there are going to be ideas people bring and without any malintent, but aren't good for other that don't meet a neutrality principle. And so there are going to be hard conversations. So PPC has this rates and contracts forum. 
um, is, do you think that's going to be the venue for staff level to like be transparent about why they came up with this idea and have some uh, maybe maybe uh, arguments amongst ourselves? Because I, I, I project arguments. I think we're going to have difficult conversations. You know, I, I think so. I mean, I, I, I've tried to think of other forums that, you know, would work. And it's really hard because some of the other industry groups are very specific to whether, you know, it's NRU or, you know, they're, they're very to a smaller group of, of utilities. So, and PPC it seems to be the broadest uh, group that we have. And, and yeah, you got to have those, those tough conversations that are uncomfortable and you may not like the, you know, the where people are coming from. But ultimately, I think that it's healthy to, to disagree because, you know, having you, maybe you just don't, you just didn't look at it through that lens. And so when someone brings up an, uh, a point, um, yeah, it may shoot down your, your, where you're going. But ultimately, I think if we're all looking for the best product for, for public power, um, you know, yeah, maybe there are ideas that aren't going to make it through and it's not personal. It's just what ends up being best for, for public power. Yeah. I have this passion around my own ideas. Uh, you may have heard some of this in, in public power underground topics. I do. I'm sensitive to the, the path forward where you bring an idea and you get defensive. Right. I think there is a lot of like self-consciousness we all need to have around, when, when we have ideas, both to be transparent with them, not defensive of them, and to actually seek input, I think is really important. So if I have a terrible idea, Holly, it's okay to tell me it's a terrible idea. Okay, good to know. Unless it's in support of seasonal time change. I was going to ask you where where the line was. So it's good to know that there is a line. I, I will, um, I'm going to avoid that uh, topic. Um Actually, I have no, I, I, again, once again, Switzerland on that one. I have no opinion <laughs> one way or the other. But, you know, I think defensive, it's, it's hard not to be defensive, right? I mean, especially if you put a lot of time into an idea that you think really has a lot of, of merit. Um, but I think or, you have to, sometimes you just have to step back, right? And just say, okay, why, why doesn't Paul like my idea? Is it because Paul doesn't like me? Maybe. I, I don't like know. Kelly. Probably not. Like <laughs> so, and it's, you know. And it's also, so uh, I'm father of three small children, right? And and one sometimes you give a child a gift, all the other kids want to play with it, and then it turns into a mess. I do think there are instances where we have to be aware of the benefits we've received from a contract construct and to make sure that uh, the, the siblings in the group uh, it doesn't like fall apart on each other. Right. And then the, just right. because somebody, I think that's another area uh, of, of friction that we'll probably see in public power and, and to have, have some honesty and transparency about that. Yeah. And then sometimes I hate to admit it, but you, it, it becomes kind of like, well, if you just maybe tweak it, you know, you start messing with, and it, it's hard to, to um, you know, not go in and say, well, you know, if you just changed these things, your idea would be really good. You know, um, <laughs> the idea is the idea. And we, you have to have the conversation around, is it going to work or not? Not, you know, and maybe you do come together and collaborate to shore it up a little bit, but um, I guess ego maybe sometimes has to be put aside and just let let the conversation be what the conversation is, not about um, whose idea is a little bit better than others. So. Yep, yep. Uh, absolutely. Any other insights or anything you want to share before we, we let you go? Um, it's been great having you. And I think this will be a fun discussion uh, for future episodes. Well, good. I'm glad to hear that. That makes me feel better. Um, trying to think if there's anything. Nope. I think we, we covered it all. I mean, I think the biggest thing that I, I just keep going back to is that transparency and that willingness to come to the table. And, you know, sometimes you just throw all the ideas on the table and, and it's amazing when you start talking about it, what sifts to the top, because, you know, um, 
just a little bit different lens that you look through. Hey, if I take this and we put it with this and pretty soon you walk away with this great product that you uh, hadn't even thought of when you walked in. So yeah. And I think, you know, we, I think in the Northwest currently, we have a pretty good culture of, uh, of peers and colleagues. And I have a lot of confidence that there are really smart people that are happy if I do well, and I'm happy if they do well. So, uh, I, I, you know, bringing in a perspective of we can all work together to try to find something is, uh, is the kind of positive attitude that maybe is too much Ted Lasso, um, and not enough, uh, I don't know. I don't have any other cultural reference on the top of my head, but not in as much Michael Scott. <laughs> as much Michael Scott, maybe. There we go. Well, the one thing I would say too is, is that's a fa- that's the um, draw of public power, in my opinion, is that we all are we do have a common goal. You know, our service territories may be different. The the people that we uh, serve may have different needs, but ultimately, you know, we're here to provide low cost, affordable, reliable uh, power to our customers. That's what we're all after. And I think that, you know, we just, we, it just makes um, what we're doing, I think so much better, special uh, kind of in a way that, you know, that's what we're here for. It is, it's not just about, um, you know, the bottom line, it's about what we do for our neighbors and the, you know, people in our community. So love the perspective. That's sappy. <laughs> yeah. Love the sappy. This is the second season of public power underground, the sappy season, the corny season. Perfect. Oh, oh yeah. yes. <laughs> so where does that put me in, in the running for the belt? I just have to ask, you know, I brought a hype man for you this. Did. You you know, did. I mean, it's certainly, we have to think about whether uh, it, the, the appearances are fungible amongst organizations, right? Cause maybe you just got two appearances because ooh. your organization had two people come. I don't know. I th- I'm just making all this up as I go. <laughs> Is that not clear? Is that not coming across that I'm just making? No, no, I would never say that. (laughs) Thank you for coming on. Great way to end it. Great conversation. Thanks, Holly. Thank you so much, Paul. This has been great. In an in-depth article on the next generation of batteries in the Financial Times, June Yoon makes what some might say is a solid case for solid state batteries as an answer to battery technology's power problem. June notes in the article that on average, electric cars remain 30% more expensive than conventional patrol vehicles, but that gap is closing and, say analysts at UBS, price parity is now just three years away. From there, demand for EVs should further accelerate, which means greater demand for batteries. Solid state batteries could reduce the consequences of fast charging seen in batteries used today, which include reduced battery life and increased risk of fires because solid state batteries don't have liquid electrolytes. There are a lot of companies making progress on solid solid state batteries and a couple look to have commercial production in the 2024 to 2025 timeframe. June notes a number of Asian companies uh, look best placed to make solid state batteries a reality. Toyota is set to unveil a prototype this year, which would take just 10 minutes to charge for 500 uh, set kilometers. Yeah. Of re- wow. Yeah. Can you cut that part? <laughs> okay. Dang it. Oh my gosh. Ian, you shut up. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, Toyota is set to unveil a prototype this year, which would take just 10 minutes to charge for 500 kilometers of range. It's Lexus LF30 concept model with the compact solid state battery was unveiled two years ago, and it now has 1000 registered patents involving a solid involving solid state battery technology. For more, you can find the article on Financial Times. Look for the article titled A Solid Case for the Next Generation of Batteries. Okay, I have I I I can't resist. There is one thing in here that really great article, very good in depth, good analysis, good exposition of the concepts. But there's this nugget in here. It's a single sentence. And I think it is the the result of people not understanding the difference between power and energy. So it has this point that yet its network of superchargers around the world would give little competitive advantage if cars could be charged as quickly at home. The limiting factor for charging cars quickly is not the battery technology. It's the amount of power you can put into the battery and the infrastructure necessary to to move that much, much energy. It's not like these can charge in 10 minutes at a 110 outlet. They can charge in 10 minutes 
if you have, you know, a 250 kilowatt uh, charging infrastructure, DC fast charger, it, it's not like the battery technology is making the car more efficient moving down the road. The battery technology just allows you to put more energy in the battery faster. That makes sense, Fawcett. I think yeah. this is this is something that I actually was like, I love the article. And then we got to this and I was like, this is just a misunderstanding of nobody's gonna be able to charge in 10 minutes at home. Not not without paying thousands of dollars to upgrade their service. Yeah. Uh, nobody has 250 kW service at their residence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah right <laughs> anyway. i mean there are probably some tesla owners that have that at their residence you think so I like that there is that recently there is um there is the math that i didn't do associated with this is is how many how many kilowatts would it actually take to do it in 10 minutes it may be megawatts mm-hmm it may be a megawatt in order to charge a battery in 10 minutes. Yeah, I mean, it depends on what percentage you're going from and to, right? I think yeah, of course. Like 20 to 80 at 100 or 150 or 250 kilowatts now is probably you're talking like 30 minutes at a supercharger, something along those lines. So if you were to triple the power, you'd probably get to do it in 10 minutes or something. Yeah. So, I mean, to the, to going back to the original point, it's not that the battery uh, makes it faster to charge. It's just, you could charge faster safely in a solid state battery. So you can put a megawatt into a battery in 10 minutes, let's say, uh, mm -hmm. it, but it doesn't, you still need all of your electrical infrastructure to get the megawatt to the battery. That's the only point. Great article, though, not to take away from the article. It's just one sentence that stood out to me. So it, would it be fair to say it's more about that battery's capacity to receive that amount of energy with a certain level of power over yeah. a, a shorter period of time? Okay. To the, to the article's credit, or the article's point, is the lithium ion has this uh, liquid electrolyte, I think is what it's called. I'm not a battery expert, but it actually makes it really like, like that's what causes fires. And the faster you charge, the more likely that volatile uh, concoction is going to explode or cause fires or something like that. So it's the solid state takes that component out. So you can do, it has a better capacity to receive the energy quicker, to have more power to deliver to it deliver to it from a different source though <laughs> still gotta get the power yeah. from somewhere yeah. right you're not doing it at home that's not a 110 outlet that's what i'll say it's not a 110 outlet shoot that's what i was planning on <laughs> okay uh moving on the technical management uh team convened on april 7th to talk about the start of spring spill season march was really dry one of the driest on record as a result the april through august water supply forecast at the dalles now stands at 90 percent next we went to the lower snake where early juvenile sampling is underway so far we've seen about one quarter of 2019's juvenile salmon pass lower granite and about three times more lamprey have passed compared to 2019. april 24th is the start of the collection and transport of juveniles to below bonneville Next, we heard from the United, uh, the Corps of Engineers about the tricky process of maintaining navigation and spill on the Lower Snake. Uh, there's still a lot of friction in the group on the changes to minimal operating pool required in order to make navigation safe at the expense of salmon. Essentially, the higher pool increases the travel time for the outbound salmon. Uh, then we heard operational reports. Grand Coulee is currently at 1270 and might be drafted another foot in order to maintain flows for chum spawning at the Bernita Bar. End of April elevation is still up in the air. Um, John Day opts to raise the four bay in order to discourage turn nesting is still a go. Uh, we also heard a report on total dissolved gas levels at the dams. Everything looks good to my untrained eye. We also heard a fish passage report. The main takeaway was that it's too early to draw meaningful comparisons to previous years. The next uh, technical management team meeting is scheduled for April 14th and for more information, Search Google for technical management team. Super there, interesting that there's a chum spawning at Bernita Bar right now. That that's just really interesting from a biological perspective. I may have uh, I may have said something stupid then. 
<laughs> is that not what <laughs> I would I'm not saying that it's not the okay. case. But they I didn't know they first went that far because they're typically like pretty quick spawners. So traveling a long ways is rare. And then, yeah, this time of year would be somewhat late, but I, I don't know. I need to do more research on it. I, I'm just interested in that. I didn't, didn't know much about it. Well, I'll have to. <laughs> it wasn't, I don't believe it was in the slides I saw, so I probably can't check what was said now, but uh, that's, that's what yeah, the notes awesome. on my page said at least. So. It yeah. could also be that, that phone. the chum spawned and now they're trying to maintain flows to help the actual uh, fry in the gravel. That might be it. Yeah. yeah. Okay, moving on. Friend of okay. the underground and editor in chief of Clearing Up, uh, Mark Orenshaw, returned to talk about an upcoming webinar news data is hosting about Northwest grid resilience. Hey, Mark, welcome back to Public Power Underground. Well, thank you, Paul. It's an honor to be back. And I guess I didn't uh, tank your ratings too much from the last appearance. So I'm glad you have Just me back. <laughs> skyrocketed when you were on. Everybody, everybody wanted to be a part of this. Everybody. Mark's a part of it. Uh, last time you we, we talked about a webinar you hosted that was on kind of resource adequacy in California in the yeah. West. Mm -hmm. um, this time, uh, I want to talk about the... The, I think it's the resource sufficiency, the nearer term, the resiliency question you have a webinar about. So in 200 words or less, uh, why should I sign up for the April 15th webinar on Northwest Grid, grid Resiliency? Yeah, no, that's a, great, that's a great question, Paul. So I guess my short answer in elevator pitch is um, I think grid resilience is and certainly will become uh, an increasingly important topic for the, the regional industry, uh, energy industry. I think, you know, I'm sorry. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Work from home happens. Um, so anyways, yeah, grid resilience will become increasingly important for the, the regional energy industry. And uh, as we've all seen just in the past year, uh, the Northwest, we've had some severe wildfires and the big snow and ice storm down in your uh, neck of the woods. And both of those affected uh, electric service quite a bit. And also California and Texas have, as we know, have suffered some, some weather related outages. So I think most people recognize, you know, climate change will exacerbate these weather extremes. And there's also, you know, a rogues gallery of other threats like cybersecurity and earthquakes. So I'm, I'm not a, a doom and gloomer by, by nature, but I think these are pretty serious concerns. And as, as you and all the other folks who work in utilities know that uh, whenever electric service is out for extended periods of time, it can be, it can be really bad and even life-threatening, um, you know, as we unfortunately and, and, and tragically saw in, in Texas. So, so we're getting together a group of, uh, I think, leading uh, Northwest Energy folks, and we're going to explore this topic. And we'll go over things like uh, what's the definition of grid resilience, uh, what's the state of grid resilience around the region, what are our strengths and, and maybe vulnerabilities, um, any takeaways from those kind of recent disruptive uh, events, and what are some ways that uh, resilience can be addressed, you know, things like accountability and, and funding. So we're honored to be joined there by uh, Michelle Cathcart from BPA, uh, Mitch Colburn from Idaho Power, uh, Scott Corwin from NWPPA, who I know is a friend of the underground. I've seen him on your show. And also uh, Letha Tawney from the Oregon PUC. I'll, I'll be the, the moderator. So basically, I think, Paul, people are going to get um, a, a better understanding, hopefully, of grid resilience and perhaps most importantly, maybe some ideas about how they might uh, work on addressing that in the, in the future. I mean, it's it's not inevitable that we'll have, you know, a Texas style breakdown in the Northwest. And, and there are certainly ways to reduce and, and you know, if not eliminate the, the risk altogether. So, so that's my pitch and I'm, I'm sticking to it. I like the pitch. I do think, you know, whatever, we're going to have some disruptions in the grid yeah. um, and, and it's unlikely it'll be the same type of event as Texas, but, yeah. you know, and, and understanding how the grid can improve to be more resilient is incredibly important topic. I mean, last time resource adequacy was this long scale planning. Now you're getting into like the near term resiliency. I, I love that dynamic. Oh, good. Yeah, it is. I mean, it is, I guess, somewhat related to resource adequacy, but it is, it's more about, yeah, how the system can kind of withstand these disruptive events and, and recover as fast as possible. So yeah, yeah it's like this. Yeah. Same issues, just different time scale. Like. Um, that's, a, that's a good way to look at it. And you're right. I mean, weather is going to happen. You know, 
other bad events are certainly going to happen. But but again, I think there are ways that, you know, it can at least be addressed. And hopefully some of this conversation will help, uh, you know, bring those to the to the fore. So. OK, I'm clicking the tickets button. It's only twenty five to thirty five dollars. This is a really low cost. That's- Best bargain you're ever going to find. So Best bargain. <laughs> and th- there's, a, there's a link uh, on News Data's website. Go on News Data's website. If it's on my screen. If I can find it, anybody can find it. <laughs> Thanks you a lot, it, Mark. You got it, Paul. That's, that's, the, that's the story. You bet, Paul. Happy to Thanks be on. Your... Thanks again. We'll have you back for sure. Oh, that would be awesome. Thanks very much, Paul. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Get that phone call. So Mark picked up the phone and uh, news data broke some news. Rick Adair broke news in a clearing up news bulletin that a group of 11 BPA power and transmission customers has called on the agency to convene a settlement process for the BPA 2022 power and transmission rate case on a comprehensive basis. The article reports that another party may formalize a settlement proposal if filed in its direct case. For more information about the settlement proposal, go to clearing up. A lot of clearing up hits this week. High five, Mark. Also, maybe one of our special rate process correspondents won't mind coming to talk about this process with us. As long as it doesn't violate ex parte rules, which we don't understand, which is why we are just quoting clearing up. To be clear, not a lawyer. you're not a party of record in the BP22 rate case. Okay, that's all the news we're covering this week. Send us any news, jobs, questions, opinions, or corrections to Paul on Twitter, at a power manager, or if you're a friend of the underground, send any of us a note. Any corrections from last week, Paul? The only thing I noticed was every time you would read out the letters SQL uh, when going for our data specialist position that's open that we want them to know what SQL is, I have always pronounced it just SQL instead of reading out SQL. It's always just been SQL to me. Uh, They're all structured query languages. So if you're interested in the data specialist position, uh, we think we know what we're doing, but we would love to have someone who actually knows what they're doing come uh, work with us. We could be, we could work together. So if you're applying, just play to the audience and call it SQL. Is that what I'm understanding? I like that. That's a good takeaway. Okay. Lieutenant Bledsoe. Yeah. Any, First, uh, I think it's very grammar? bold to say that I don't perfectly understand Latin, which I do. And so ex oh, parte, I, I, I grok completely. So um, second, Brian transposed the word if and it, which completely changed the meaning of that sentence. Uh, and Paul, in the introduction, when Brian was reading off a list of five things, somehow Paul arrived at six things so it's because i broke i broke up the interviews with blake shalide and with uh mark orenshaw which are enumerated differently in the script than uh really sounds right when he's reading it so we went to six okay and i actually just completely um rewrote parts of that lead because it didn't make sense when i read it while we were doing the rest of the podcast for the first time um and, and Aaron yeah, can't I, take criticism today, so there are no correction corners for Aaron. <laughs> oh, I don't know about that. I think Ian mentioned something <laughs> earlier uh, for correction from last week. I think he mentioned something about a citation actually being issued for this one. Uh, oh, I'll pick man. it to... I, I listened clear. to it over and over. Was I was clear. really hoping to call her out on it, but it's, I'm not sure. It's not incorrect enough quite to give a citation out. Oh, okay. Just a warning. dollar fine. Okay. Also, I think it's pretty clear that uh, SQL should be pronounced SQL because it was invented by IBM back in the day. And uh, initially it was called SQL, the word S-E-Q-U-E-L. I hope that's how you spell SQL. It It was spelled out like that, but they had to change the name because it was copyrighted. This just makes me so, call it something ridiculous, like Sequel. However, <laughs> there also exists a structure, a open source structured query language called MySQL. And in their specification, they inform you how to pronounce the name of their software. And it is to be pronounced MySQL. Ian so. will forward those documents along. We'll make them available on the tube. 
for your pleasure. <laughs> There's always more to the story. <laughs> and ex parte means not a party to. Okay. Well, thanks for setting the record straight. Paul and Ian. <laughs> 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 I don't know where to go. I no oh, oh, one more thing. Um, oh, we'll be back <laughs> next week to talk about public power and public power adjacent news. Try to keep this short. We got a lot of content to fit in here. To make sure you don't miss an episode, you can sign up for an unintrusive newsletter with links to all the ways to consume this fascinating content on Substack at publicpowerunderground.substack.com. Otherwise, you can subscribe on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcast, or your favorite podcast app. That's all for this week. Thanks for tuning in. Hey, public power people. We're all in this together. No, this won't be forever. Hey, public power people. We're all in this together. Whatever we endeavor, yeah. Public Power Underground is Northwest Public Power News from a Power Department's perspective, presented for entertainment purposes. It's written, edited, and produced by the Power Department. The views here are expressed to our own and not the official views of Klotzkin IPUD, nor of any person or organization affiliated or doing business with Klotzkin IPUD, nor the organization of the guests also appearing on Public Power Underground. Neither Klatskin IPUD nor those appearing on Public Power Underground generate ad revenue from the episodes. Make Almaz, Holly, Brian, Blake, and Mark feel better about their participation in this week's episode by sending them a note, text, or email with a thumbs up telling them how much you enjoyed it. Do it for us, do it for them, and do it to make other people feel valued and appreciated. Public Power Underground for electric utility enthusiasts. Public Power Underground, it's work to watch!